Imagine learning in a small group intimate setting while exploring unique European locations. EU Vet CE Experiences offers race-approved CE seminars that combine half-day lectures with time to relax and discover captivating cultures. The CE sessions are delivered in English, allowing you to elevate your career while vacationing with loved ones. Experience the perfect blend of learning and luxury at EU Vet CE Experiences interactive seminars in hand-picked European destinations. Elevate your knowledge and recharge simultaneously. Visit euveterinaryce.com to learn more. I'm excited to share the journey of a veterinarian who was trained in Romania and was one of the first generations of veterinarians to seriously practice companion animal medicine in that country. And thanks to the inspiration of a TV show, Dr. Levinti moved his family, including three cats, over 5,000 miles all the way to Calgary, Canada. This was just the start for this foreign trained veterinarian before he could actually practice as a veterinarian in North America and achieve his dreams. You'll learn how he ended up succeeding as a solo doctor practice owner in the United States. He also talks about the hardest part of having to sell the practice he built from the ground up and his exciting new adventures today, which you may want to be a part of. I will say that the audio quality of this episode is not quite my standard, so I do apologize. But Lavendi has a fascinating story worth listening to, and he gives some great insights into being a veterinarian that I think you'll appreciate. So let's get to the conversation. Welcome to Vet Life Reimagined. I'm very excited to have you on the podcast. And you have a little unique beginning as well, because your story kind of starts in Romania, and a a lot of us don't know much about growing up in Romania, so that'll be exciting as well. But of course, the first question I ask everyone is, When did you know that you wanted to get into veterinary medicine? So when did you know for yourself? Yes, I'm from Romania. I'm from Transylvania. It's a pretty famous place. So probably if they don't know about Romania, I'm pretty sure everybody knows about Transylvania. So getting to your question, you know, when I was a kid, I started my vacation with my grandparents in the countryside in a pretty idyllic location, was surrounded by all kinds of animals. Family dogs and carrots and sheep and poultry, you know, chicken and anything there. So I kind of was excited with that in, in, in that way. I was to witness the sort of flying for those animals and being pretty sad when I didn't see one of them the next day. And I remember one time having one of our family dog pass away and I was kind of crying as a kid for days and days. You get better, but it was really kind of traumatizing being as a kid. And that was, you know, my childhood. So when I came right to you a little bit later on, I go to high school, I really liked biology and I really liked everything about it. It just was one of the things that, you know, something might be for me to do for the rest of my life. It was probably the last few years or probably the last year of high school when we kind of needed to decide, okay, which part I'm going to take. I choose veterinary medicine because I really like the idea of interaction with animals and I really like the idea of being more kind of active profession because being a biologist at the time in Romania meant, okay, you're going to be most likely in a research environment or you're going to be in the academia. And this is something I was not really keen on at the time. So I said, okay, you know, it's really close to biology. I'm going to do veterinary medicine. And then when I decided, okay, this is something I'm going to give a shot and I'm going to, to try it. Very interesting. And so a couple of questions. One, do you mind sharing a little bit about what that school is like in Romania? Because depending on the country, you know, the curriculum can be a little bit different. And then also, when you were thinking about going into vet school, did you have an idea of what that might look like for you, like what animals you might work with? And did that change as you were going through vet school? This is a really good Yeah, things I've read like, very differently in Romania. I finished the high school in 1999, and I applied to get into the veterinary college in 90. So at that time, he passed an exam actually to get into the college. The way how you get into the college, it was very different compared to happening in the U.S. or Canada, or even what's happening in Romania these days. Every time, there were 
community candidates who want spot to get into the college. So it's a very, very competitive. So I was really happy that I managed to get in. And I think probably it's important to remember at the time, the education in veterinary medicine in Romania was made focused on farm, large animals. The component of the small animals was pretty small at the time. Because that was the culture and that was the environment. And also we have to remember the political context of Romania in 90, you know, the Berlin Wall came down in November 89. Things in Romania changed a month later in December. So I finished the high school in a free country yeah. and I got into the college in the first year after the exchange for Italy. So like with every challenge, political transition there, Really different changes are coming to the society. Some they good, some of them not as good. So I was in, in the college. It's a six year program. In the first two years, you are kind of maybe focusing on pre clinical studies and, you know, like biochemistry, biophysics, and archenics, geology, even computer science. There was no internet yet, but we kind of were exposed to computer science at the time and, you know, for years, obviously focusing on the clinical aspect of the profession. But as I said, probably 75% of it were focused on far and larger animals, and it's a really tiny percent on small animals. You know, I got my degree in 96. I didn't know at the time exactly what I was doing to do. At the time, I was finishing the college, you had to go into the army, which is, so I went to the army for six months. And I come back. Things kind of really changed in the society for the last probably six, seven years, starting from 1996, 97. The West and the American culture has arrived in Romania. So that actually there was more exposure to what's going to happen in the West. There was a really turning point for me in my career that kind of came to Romania. Later. There was a show called Emergency Vets on Animal Planet. And that when the came on, I was basically drawn to the TV every time when I saw the shows. And I remember the doctors from there, and I can't be too sure of that his colleagues doing things there. And I said, oh, this is something I really want to do. This is my passion and something I want to do for life. So that was really, you know, the first kind of journey point for me, seeing the show, because that honestly changed my career in this fashion. The other things kind of would like to mention that in Romania, I was part of the first generation of veterinarians that practice small animal medicine. So more and more clinics opened up at the time. I was the you know, co-owner with the you know, partners of the clinic until 2005, when we actually decided to move to Canada with my wife and three cats. Things changed a lot in the society and different levels. They got to the point they got the care they need and they were taken care of by the individual level. We realized that there might be decades until some of the changes we hope for come. So we decided to, okay, we are going to try, cross the path, go to a different country and basically start from zero. So you were not the first person to mention emergency vets. <laughs> so that show really did have an impact on a lot of people, which I'm, I'm glad to hear. And I can imagine it being very exciting to be part of that initial wave of really changing a type of medicine, you know, helping this new, at the time, you know, category of, of animals really getting serious about their health care and watching these cultural changes come about. And then also now you're, you, you're talking about moving to a whole nother culture in 2005. And with that, I think I'm sure you had to take a break because that's a lot to move over. I'm sure there's a lot of things that come with that. And, and you said you brought your family and, and three cats as well. So that was a lot to move. <laughs> Poor yeah. cats. They're, they're not good about change in general. So it, it, it really is to me well, you know, and one of the things I realized with cats, I really love cats. They do really well when they are with the ones they love. Yeah, even now I'm traveling with cats and they have no whatsoever. So they did. I'm not saying it's easy, I'm not saying to people to do that, but you know, it's not complicated sometimes as it might sound like. 
maybe you can do some series on how to travel long distance with your cats because I think talk about cultural shifts. We are going through a time when traveling with our pets is getting more and more common. In fact, I just came back from a conference and there's one cat in particular that he's very well known that he travels with his human (laughs) everywhere he goes. His name is Bug. And apparently Bug has inspired other veterinarians to travel with their cats. So I'm hearing more and more people are doing that. You're typing, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's possible. And, And maybe in some aspects, actually easier than dogs because I always wonder, you know, is my dog going to sit in the hotel room and bark or you know, something like that? And cats, you know, they oh, can no. out, but you know, they're pretty quiet for sure. Yeah. So, you know, once you got to Canada, what was your experience? Because again, you're talking about cult- there's cultural changes, political changes, really looking at how we can better, uh, you know, medically support cats and dogs. What was your experience and especially personally kind of and probably a lot of career thoughts and changes as well. You know, it was very exciting for us to be there and just start a new life for sure. You know, it was a little bit, you know, in 24 hours, you just fly from Romania and you get to downtown Calgary, the city where we arrived in 2005. You know, I have seen lots of big buildings and, you know, some like this and everything in movies, but until then, I had no idea how they look back in real life and I was living on a I think if I remember correctly, I was very stuck on the floor of those buildings. Oh, wow. uh, well, it was really crazy and pretty really exciting at the time, for sure. So, but we really wanted to do something different with our lives, and we really wanted to succeed. And we took it as a challenge and really embraced everything that we came across there, for sure. And for me, it was really important. I... So the show, the emergency bed, so okay, I really want to be that bad. You know, I work at that level because that was really important for me. So, in other words, I really wanted to get better at my job and move up in terms of, you know, the care you provide for the patient. And I was really excited about the opportunity, but as you know, being a foreign trained vet, you cannot just walk into the clinic the next day and say, okay, I would like to apply for the job because it's not going to happen. So you really want to get her time and make sure that you go through the certification process, like apply an outlet and like PPE, the clinical proficiency examination. Of course, you need to do your only language requirements will be there. So that was the first step. But the question is, what do you do between getting there and you will be able to actually practice veterinary medicine? So that's a really big question for most of us that foreign trained vets and what do we do? Because there's, there's going to be some years for most of us until you are going to practice what you like and what you love. So for me, it was okay, I'm not going to do pizza delivery for sure. So I really want to go somewhere and work in a clinic. So I had the opportunity and the luck to meet some really wonderful people at the time in the city. And they helped me to get my first job in the industry. And that was technically stand at one of the local 24 hour emergency costs. And for me, it was, wow, it was crazy just walking to that place in, you know, in, after a few weeks after I left Romania because it was everything so different for me. And I really loved the idea to be there. Then also, it was really good for me because I was working nights, so from 10 o'clock in the evening of the 8 o'clock in the morning seven days on, seven days off. So it was pretty tough to do at the beginning of the seven days in a row, but I really like the idea that I had, okay, I have one week off, but I really can focus on what I'm doing, you know, get my English exam done and get myself prepared for the monopoly and for the CPE. So I really like the schedule this way because it gave me, you know, that uninterrupted one week where I was able to focus on, okay, this is on right today important for me to do. And it was really, I don't know, I really liked my time in the hospital, honestly, working night. And, you know, I have, even now, I cherish most of the moments there, you know, just sometimes walking the dogs outside, minus 40 degrees, or cleaning the cages, or seeing, you know, beautiful, beautiful sunrises, most beautiful ones I've ever seen in my life. So those are the memories that are with me and, you know, obviously getting myself ready for the next step. 
And one of the nice things about practicing category in the province of Alberta at the time was, okay, if you get your monthly the first step, then you can practice a veterinarian on the supervision. So that was for me a goal to achieve. So I kind of managed to do that after, I think, one and a half years, something like that. So I got into the practice and I was working like a veterinarian. And that was great because somehow my dream came true. And one year later, probably two and a half years after we arrived in Canada, I did my CPE and that was done in, in the States in Las Vegas. So I got fully licensed two and a half years. And I was really called that, okay, I'm really there where I wanted to be. I really want to mention that I am one of the sport I trained backers, that they come to this great countries like Canada in the US every year. And I, I know what they feel. I feel their pain. I know their challenges. And I know it takes a lot of time, but I think that one of the most important things for them would be stay focused because I'm really, really sure that their dream will come true one day. But it's important to stay focused and have patience. Very well said. I think we can all learn that sometimes. I think our veterinary training in general is a very long training. And so I think we're often faced with this challenge of patience to get to where we finally want to go. And you were doing this after you'd already done a lot of training. So good for you on on being able to stick with it. And it it can even take longer than that, I I have heard. So that is great that you are so persistent. And it does sound like you had great opportunities to not only have time to work on those credentialing, but you were also getting experience and, and probably at least had your hand in some of what you were, the taste of what you were looking for. So that's good as well. Something that helped me a lot later on, years later when I, you know, I became, became a practice owner, because it's very important to get the feel of it from the level of the tech assistant, the receptionist, and going up to the doctor. Very few people working in our industry have that seat and they know really. And it really, really helped me a lot to see, okay, how is that tech assistant feels like? How they would like to do their job? What job satisfaction means to that? And all the kind of questions, I did the job and I knew, okay, this is really important for me. And when I was later on a business owner, I really wanted to make sure that, okay, it got it's important. Be happy with the job you have and where you are. Yeah, it, it definitely helps that you're, you're able to relate to multiple people in the practice. And like you just said, you you did work your way to becoming owner again of a hospital in Canada. So what was your journey up to that point? Because that, that took a few years to get exactly. to that point. So what were you kind of finding and what attracted you to becoming an owner again? So we stayed in Calgary for four years. We had really great food for or the opportunities the city gave us at the time. But on the other hand, we could not get used to the snow. So we kind of decided, okay, we want to get something like this, so we what we did, we moved from Calgary to your week now on the other side of the country, in British Columbia and Victoria, that's a really beautiful city on Vancouver, on Vancouver. So that was in 2009, and funny, at the time I applied for a job and I was working as an associate at one of the important clinics in the city. And funny enough, when I came to Canada, I said, oh, I'm not going to be owner, I have just, something doesn't really interest me anymore. And after working in that PA for one and a half or two years, something like that, I decided, no, I really like to take the ownership role seriously again and see where it takes us. And I'm really happy I did for, for the opportunity that I had at the time to make it. Yeah. So when you became owner, what were some things that you found really exciting about having that responsibility? And then what were maybe some of your biggest challenges that you found as well? You know, it was really exciting to start something from scratch. First of all, so we built the clinic in downtown Victoria and it was, you know, something we designed from scratch and we designed the way all we wanted. And the challenge was, okay, we have zero patients. So we need to start from zero and see just slowly, slowly got to build it up. So that was a really a challenge. But one of the things we knew at the time, one of the, we need a great team with good people and great culture of respect and great culture of, you know, where people can improve themselves. 
and where people support each other. So that was really, really important for us from the beginning. And for me at the time as a solo practitioner, one of the things that really was really important is to run myself with people that I can like specialists, have a radiologist, I have an internal medicine specialist, clinical pathologist that I can talk to. So I really wanted to have a team online so that I can consult with them because being a solo owner, it, it's a really morning place. And you need that sometimes that somebody is going to tell you, and it's important to connect and have that team around you because that's how it grow. And one of the things that's important is it's really important to have a really good team that's kind of surrounding you because the better the team, the better the care that you provide to your patient. Yes. And that was the word that was coming to my mind as well is lonely. When you're a solo practitioner, you have all this responsibility, but you may not feel like you have that opportunity to bounce things off of them, to get support. So people who kind of know what you're going through. I think they talk about leadership being lonely. It's lonely at the top, <laughs> something like that. And so it is important to have a good, strong team within the practice that support you, but also to find a support team outside of the practice as well, I think. So you can continue to grow. I, I know that you're a person who loves to constantly learn and continue to grow yourself as to be able to provide such quality care to your patients. So all of those things are, I think, really, really important. And I'm, I'm glad that you're, you're talking about that. So you also talked about your love for cats. And it's obvious that that has been a thing for a long time. And I think that's something you're continuing to look into. So when did you decide to maybe focus a little bit more on cats? That's probably, I don't know if it's really recently, it's kind of all one of the you know, dreams of mine to do that. But when I was an owner, I called a few times and, you know, I just could have managed to do it. Growing the practice, being there, doing the things, I just did not manage to have time to pursue one of the things I really wanted to do. So, kind of focusing on female medicine kind of came in after we sold the practice. I took a career break and I really wanted to, okay, what I'm going to do with my profession for the last 20 years or 25, because I really want to be in this profession as long as I can. So one of the things came into my mind, well, if I'm going to start and get uh, the A being the A certification and see I'm cracking. And I said, well, it was a great idea. It could be a challenge that I really love. So I managed to connect with a wonderful mentor. And she helped me during the uh, process the submitting my credentials. That was kind of last year. And kind of 10 days ago, I got pretty great news because my credentials were accepted. So now it's kind of study time because I really want to pass the board exam in November this year. So that's kind of the challenge for me at the moment, but it took a lot of time, but I'm really happy that I'm here and I'm really grateful for the good today. It is never too late to pursue interests and in new things. So yeah. I'm glad that, that is something that you also agree with and are finding out. I do want to go back because you talked about selling your practice. And I, I think this is a, a common question and thought right now, because one, there's more interest in selling and uh, buying practices, I think. But I think this could really help people. Do you mind... Thinking back and, and explaining what your thoughts were in deciding to sell your practice. To get to the point where you say, okay, I'm very sad. I'm in a lot of situation and just kind of talking to her or listening to podcast. There was people out there with kind of similar experience on the ball like mine. You start practice for stress, you can see your patients, you grow, you are pretty enthusiastic, you believe, you know, for years and years and years. And one of the things that's going, is going to happen at some point, you are going to work way more than you're supposed to work. I remember kind of putting into 60 to 80 hours a week into the clinic. And I remember doing priors, doing client communication in airport, going vacation for travel, going to do. So one of the things that I don't recommend anybody to do that, but at the time, you know, I felt, okay, this is something I need to do, and I need to make sure that all these things are done. But, you know, I didn't realize, you know, I have 24 hours a day like everybody else, so I was trying to push all the time. Oh, I can do this, I can do that. So I was really trying to do that. So 
So that's one of the things you are going to run into. You. And the other thing that's going to happen, you know, probably towards the last few years of the ownership, some kind of dark clouds are going to start gathering on the horizon in terms of it was extremely hard in the shortage of that, the shortage of tax. And it's really started to impact Chile and how, you know, by decision some. Because I remember putting out an ad for that and getting one resume in one year. So that was one of the things that, yeah, you know, it's just really hard. You know, it's going to be extremely, extremely challenging, right? But in the meantime, you know, you have to go there, you have to be present, you have to do the job, and you grow the team, and you know, try not to let people down. You know, your staffs, your clients, your patients, your family, you can do all those things, right? But at some point, you get the, oh, okay, I realized I'm burned out. Um, and it was some of the things that was really hard for me to see how I want it. Yeah, just one of, one of the things that I, I, I wasn't able to face it. Uh, I'm not sure why. Uh, no, I, I can say, uh, and I think it's important to say, hopefully other people are not going to make the same mistakes. They, they can learn something from it, or they don't do this thing because sometimes where you like that. I think I used to go to the pink in the mornings, probably two hours before opening because I really liked the client at the place. So I was the, you know, lots of administration and all the kind of other things. And you remember one of the police there, you know, I sat in the car for half an hour. I was just not able to get out and walk into the pink. Um, and they said, oh, this is not good. Uh, and, and that was from the point where, you know, it made me think a little bit about this. But you know, okay, put it under the rock. It's okay. Don't let people down and kind of carry on. So I did that for some time until kind of, you know, the pandemic just called me. And that was one of the things that made us as a family and then the individual network to ask some really serious questions, you know, what we are going to do, who we are, what's important for us. And having pretty long discussions with my wife. We kind of decided to kind of do that, but um, okay, you know, we we know what we don't want to do. I don't want to work 60, 80 hours a week. That's pretty much long. I'm not really sure if I want to be in theater practice anymore. So, but all those things kind of really are new at the time. We had no idea what's going to be next. And talking about, you know, the clinic and setting the clinic, probably one of the hardest things I, might, I did in my life was planning to my staff. We are going to sell it. And because I could not imagine that it's going to be that hard, honestly, never ever. And even the last few months, being at the clinic, it was kind of really emotional roller coaster. Because you know, you're breaking the news to the clients, you say goodbye to them, and I was really overcome by the support and their understanding. Sometimes we are really more and don't pay attention to these things because probably we might not have the time. But, you know, there are people out there, they really do appreciate the work we do. And we should have a problem. Wow. Thank you for sharing all that because I, I think a lot of people have felt similarly and it's always good to know that you're not alone. And I don't think a lot of people talk about the the part of having to tell these individuals who you've worked with, who have stuck with you and all those long hours and starting your practice that you're making this decision. It's a huge decision. And I don't think we always give enough time and appreciation for that part of it, of, of having to bring everybody along in this decision. And so I also want to acknowledge that that also is a, that's a big leap of faith too. <laughs> to not fully understand what's coming next. I think that scares a lot of us not knowing the next step. I think that's why some of us kind of panic when we get to the end of vet school and we're like, oh no, I'm starting to run out of the very concrete knowledge of what comes next. And so I think that's also really huge as well. And you know, I, I, I think so far from what I know of you, good things are coming of it. Like you said, you're able to have that time to really focus on an area of medicine that you hadn't been able to spend a lot of time on. And then at the same time, you became a different type of entrepreneur. You started a slightly different type of business, which is also very exciting. And I think it can incorporate a lot of what we've talked about, about 
you know, the things that are important to us and being able to combine all of them. So you have started a continuing education experience business, and I'm really excited about it because I personally love to travel and this is focused in Europe. So do you mind sharing a little bit about the journey to the idea of starting this, what's kind of gone into it? And when you said you're set, you're sitting for your board exam in November, I was like, uh, you have a couple, you have a trip in October and November. So <laughs> good luck. <laughs> We're just studying with all of that. But yeah. So what, what's the story with that? You know, this, once we saw the clinic and we said, okay, we are going to take a break. We decided, okay, we're going to traveling. We are going to be traveling to you. Yeah, that's going to be toward the end of the pandemic. Everything was pretty safe. You could do those things. And you go to Europe, kind of reconnect with your roots and see what's kind of coming and just kind of, you know, not having any kind of expectations. Um, and I know it's really hard. Personally, I really like the challenge that the change kind of brings to us, provides us. You know, I really like to push boundaries professionally and, you know, with my personal life most of the time. But it's not easy, it's really complicated. For me, and it might be pretty hard on the people to run you know, sometimes you might be not easy on your partner or for your kids, but it, it's a pretty challenging thing to do for sure. So, we traveled only after a few years, you know, there are two things kind of started to crystallize in my mind when you are talking to my wife about all these things. And, you know, one of them would be, you know, more certification to her medicine, and the other one, you know, I'll keep your brain to organize some CD. Our seminars in Euro, but do it a little bit differently and especially bring really new concept to Euro. So we started talking about it. Now oh, let's buy it or kind of give it a try. And one of the things we I had in mind at the time, being as a veterinarian and especially in general practice, you have a really structured and really strict schedule. People that had no idea about this, I knew. When I start my schedule at eight o'clock in the morning, most of the days I knew what I was doing at the six o'clock. Sometimes, you know, you can be seeing an emergency or finishing your dental procedure in one time, but you knew all the things what's going to happen. So there was a pace to it. And sometimes pretty fast because, you know, it's comforting to know what you are going to do day long. But on the other hand, the pressure to be on time can be really, really stressful. And people have expectation. Oh, we're five minutes late. <laughs> so you really need to be and you try to do your best to, you know, meet people's expectation in this way. And this is something similar I felt when I was going to kind of larger conference, especially in the US or even in Europe. We go to the big place. Oh, I want to see that. I want to see that. Um, and you find yourself from one little one room to another one trying to catch the lecture that you really want to hear and see, right? And sometimes, oh, this is really senior for what they need to practice, you know, it's the same kind of pace. You don't have the chance to, you know, push the brakes, relax, see where you are on the whole moment. And I said, oh, okay, so we would like to do something where we create an environment where, okay, you can call, you push the brakes, you can relax, you can look around, and you can work at the same time because we offer you pretty unique your, your locations where, you know, in lots of things to do, there's culture, there's nature, there's really entertainment. We have home days, lectures, so you can the morning or in the afternoon on the the seminar, but for the rest of the day, you can do basically whatever you want. You know, you can just create memories for yourself, with your family or friends, or connect with yourself. Because sometimes that's the only thing that we want, but don't get the opportunity to do it. So that's something you can definitely do. So, yeah, we started working on these ideas and it's okay, we are focusing on Europe, kind of biased to that, and see, okay, where are we start for the things? And, you know, Spain came up pretty first on the, on the list because I really like the country and I really feel that's a great country to visit and enjoy and kind of learn at the same time. And we started with two locations this fall while we did on my island. The other one is on Costa Blanca, in the southern part of Spain. Really beautiful location. They are really different in many, many ways. There are some of them extremely luxurious, some like in, uh, in Mallorca. It really tucked away. And the location in Costa Blanca, it's 
totally different in the middle of the nature. It just gives you a totally different feel. But at the same time, you're not really far away from anything that you want to do. You know, go to the beach, go to the theme park, do everything you want, go have a really nice wine tasting or whatever, you know, fit your schedule that day. Yeah. I have looked at the pictures. They both look absolutely gorgeous. And I have traveled quite a bit over Europe, including to Romania, but I have not gone to Spain, believe it, <laughs> believe it or not. So it looks absolutely beautiful. And I do I do like that aspect of it. I think you're right. I think it's very, and not just in veterinary medicine, although I think it's it's very strong in veterinary medicine. We feel like we have to be on this tight schedule, jumping from thing to thing. And it is nice to be able to, we can say we're, we're here for CE, we're, we're here for a good purpose. At the same time, we can enjoy things like this. And interesting enough, one of the last questions I end podcasts with is, what's something on your bucket list? And almost always, I, I mean, I cannot actually think of a, one that does not include travel as one of those things. So we can actually pull in these big bucket list things that we've talked about and give ourselves permission. I hate that we have to do that, but give ourselves permission to be able to do those things and by coupling it with continuing education, which we have to do anyway. And so I really appreciate these ideas, this kind of break from the traditional 50 minute, you know, you have 10 minutes to go to the bathroom, get your coffee and, and get to the next one. And, and so I'm really excited by these new ideas around how we can really approach continuing education. And you still have that opportunity to meet with colleagues, which I also think is really important at CE events. But again, yeah, have that space for yourself too, to, to think, enjoy nature or the other things that really excite you, whether it's wine tasting. So I'm super excited for you. I think this is a really neat opportunity for the profession. And your first trips, like we talked about, are coming up in these really beautiful locations. And the other thing too, I, I think sometimes these big conferences can be really distracting because there's so many opportunities. As a education nerd too, who's, who's like, I just want to hear everything. It, it's also nice to really focus on what do I really want to focus on my education this year or something like that. And your events are very, they're specific, right? They have certain topics that you're really going to focus on. And I, I think that can also be really helpful for people too. So you're not distracted by this other cool talk that's going on. You're very intentional about your goals and what you want to learn. So you can focus on that as well. Was that also something you were thinking about when you were designing these? Yeah, absolutely. We wanted to design something at a small group, interactive, or intimate setting, where you feel relaxed, you know, and you can have a question, you can have a conversation with the speaker. Afterwards, you can just have a talk with your colleagues if you want. And one of the nice the things about this, you know, we are going to have to these from, from Haiti, from Belgium, from different other European countries, from Canada, from the US. So it's a really, really quality cultural melting pot for the profession. And something that is really, really exciting about this, the, the end of the day, profession, we are just, especially these days, it, the only information out there is it's a dream about everybody, you know. We feel so close to each other, you know. We start talking to each other and we all, okay, what the other person is talking okay. about. It's not like in the night and, and I was going to, you know, internet cafes to find a literature in English about veteran medicine. And of course, okay, it was a little bit different. These days, you know, it's just kind of out there. It's much easier for us to connect and just be part of it. Big family that we are as first worry. Yeah, I mean, it brings back something else that we talked about, right? Is finding that community of support that mm -hmm. is outside of the clinic. Because I think you're right. The things that we probably remember the most about conferences, probably not a particular talk, is probably the interaction with the other people that were there. And in fact, I have heard on multiple occasions that the things people remember was a conversation they had on a bus that was taking them from the hotel to the conference center, you know, with a colleague. So really being able to have that relaxed base of building relationships and connections, those are the things that are really going to hit. And again, if you're focused around certain topics, even more so, I think you'll benefit not, pers not just personally by building those relationships, but I think it'll help retain the information 
because you are, it's more than listening to a lecture. You're having these small group conversations and probably talking about each other's experiences with it as well. So again, back to that, bringing in all these aspects of things that I think really revise us or revive us as well, because I'm sure other people have felt it. I just got back from a conference, so I can talk about this. You, you come back from a conference and you're just exhausted. You're lucky if you remember anything that you learned. But, you know, it's more of like, OK, now I need a vacation after this conference because you're so exhausted. But if you can be in this more relaxed place where you're you're still learning, you're still connecting, but it is more relaxing and, and it is has that calming aspect and that you can come back so refreshed and be able to implement the things that you have just learned. And one of the other things that we really would like to mention is the fact that usually we have two different topics or my real case for one single topic for the seminar for the lectures. And that's really helpful because you don't have too many distractions like you mentioned. And the other thing would be they are kind of really packed with practical things. Because for me, it was all the time really important what each of those lectures as a, as a clinician, I really want to get something awesome that I can apply next day in my practice. So I can be a better doctor. I can provide a better care for my patients. That was really, really important for me. We really wanted to focus on this aspect. Okay, it's interactive, it's small, we're focusing on water to talk, but you are going to get lots of practical tips that you can take home to the health of your practice. And even if you think on one two, I'm really sure we are going to make a huge impact on, you know, your patient. I agree. I think it's good to hear like the the new research, but I'm sure other people have gotten to the end of the research and it's like, well, that was interesting, but what do I do about it now? <laughs> How does this apply to me? And, and so especially as a, a specialist, <laughs> we're, we're often like, Okay, well, that was an interesting paper, but that doesn't change anything about what I'm going to do. So that's very good that you are focused so much on the practicality of being able to leave this and actually make a difference back in your practice the next day. Well, we are running out of time. So before we have our final few questions, is there anything else that's on your mind or thoughts that you would like to offer to the veterinary profession? I really want to offer the opportunity to take a vacation. I have a really nice team for sure. That's something I really want to do for them. They help take the opportunity to get your career, do this higher up, and we really wonderful people have a good time with your family. And the other thing probably would be for me to give your profession to finish my PI board certification. Um, and I really want to use that knowledge uh, for the benefits of kids. I do not know at the moment how that's going to work out. Uh, you know, sometimes I, I really want to go back to the clinical practice, but now I do know at the moment. But there are different kind of ways that I can definitely use that knowledge that I can give back to you. To, to yeah, that's what Vet Life Reimagined is all about, right? Uh, all the different opportunities that we have to take our interests and our skills and take that out into the world in a lot of different ways. So thank you so much for embracing that philosophy as well and sharing that with us. So I like to end with a final few questions. So the first question is, I'll, I'll pull in that one I just talked about. Is there anything on your bucket list that you would like to do? That's the right task. I think that's the short term most important thing for me. Yes, I, I understand when that is like the main thing that is occupying yeah. your Yes. Just let me just get past this test. So definitely understand that feeling for sure. And is there anything that maybe like a skill or an interest that maybe not a lot of people know about that you have? Yeah, probably. I like to bake sourdough bread. And I like to make pizza when I can. And I'm really proud, you know, a few weeks ago, I mastered to make a sourdough pizza. So based on sourdough, something. I was told it pretty challenging to do, but it came out really nice. I mean, I have probably to feed my sourdough that's kind of six years old. So that's really a kind of passion of mine. And it's totally different biology science, but it's kind of different from a tree medicine, but I really like it in the same. Yeah. And very practical because it's very tasty and it feeds you. Absolutely. We'll share it. Love it. And finally, what is something you are very grateful for? 
grateful for all the people in my life who helped me to be what I am today. And I really wanted to mention, like, especially my mom and my wife, um, then my friends and all the people that came into my life along the way, and they had me to be the person I am today, for sure. And also, I am really grateful to this profession, to virtual medicine, because it gave me almost everything I had to date. So I'm great to be part of this. I hope you enjoyed this fascinating veterinary story. We can make an impact in so many places. Check out the show notes for lots of resources. Please make sure you are subscribed on your podcast app, subscribe on the YouTube channel, and follow me on LinkedIn where I hang out the most. You can contact me on LinkedIn, on the website at vetliferemagine.com, and brand new is that you can text me. To send me a text message, find the link at the top of the show notes below that says, send us a text message. I want to thank our longtime sponsors, Fire Consulting and Will Hughes, who support the podcast over on our hosting platform, Buzzsprout. You can support the podcast too. Just check out the show notes for a link. And I hope to see you next time on Vet Life Reimagined.